Hey, Swanee, what do you think of my broom here? <laughs> Alan, you may have found your right place in life. <laughs> well, with this broom, I think I could do a great job. It's made with corn husks. What's well, interesting to compare uh, tools we use today uh, to tools of the past. For instance, give me an idea of what this is here on the floor. That's a type of grill that you would place over the fireplace, and at any yeah. given time, uh, then you would see small fires arranged around within this large hearth. So it wasn't like one big fire going on. No, that was that was not very efficient. Sure, sure. And what about what about this? It's a toaster. <laughs> it's a toaster, and uh, very, I, I, di very different looking than the toaster I, I used. Uh, it was a little tougher to use, but uh, but very effective. And and what about this big flat? Is, was this for like taking bread out or some or moving coals around? Exactly, it was a peel, and it was again a multitask tool. All of these things are bespoke work; they're blacksmith made. None of these are mass produced; they're all unique, bespoke pieces. Well, you know, people are so fascinated by history, and what I love about what you all do here is that you actually put a lot of this to work. And I know next door they're. Uh, cooking up a dish. They are indeed, and we'd we'll love to show you. Let's go check it out. Wow, it smells good in here. Yeah, this is our uh, pre-Civil War kitchen. This, this is a reconstruction of an 1840s kitchen in Little Rock. It's, it's marvelous. I mean, and I'm loving the warmth from this firebox. That little fire is really throwing out a lot of heat. It does, and, and the way the back of the fireplace is made, the back of the hearth, uh, the firebox is made, it reflects naturally so you don't have to put a fire back in there. Now, is this a Rumford? It is based. All, most of these fireplaces by this time uh, uh, Count Rumford, even out in the wilds of Arkansas, he was known. <laughs> and for good reason. Now, now tell me about this, Swanee. This is a, obviously a cooker and the ladies are, are serving up something lovely here because I can smell, it smells like chicken. Alan, it's a reflector oven with its own built-in turning jack like you'd see at Williamsburg. So what I do, just raise this up? Raise that oh, up. Oh, looky there. And it's on a spit. Wow. And, and the spit actually turns. The chicken is finishing up. Well, it sure is. It's beautiful. Looks like they've got it wrapped in herbs. They do. I think uh, thyme, those are in our time and herbs we grow and rosemary yeah. grow here in our raised bed gardens. And so it has a an, a bottom there that catches the, the the fat drippings. So this device, give me an idea of, of how early one would have seen one of these cookers. Uh, well, again, we're talking about malleable sheet metal, bespoke work. So we're looking at, at late 18. You start seeing these larger reflector ovens by the third quarter of the 18th century fourth quarter, and then they become really popular during the 19th century when they learned how to roll this metal. And many homes would uh, would not have thought to had uh, their kitchen furnished without one. Yeah, yeah, it was a thing to have. And it looks like over here we've just got a classic Dutch oven uh, underway with hot coals on it. It's, it's three-legged, and that way you can burn coals. And you may remember earlier I mentioned that they would make several small fires around the fireplace. Well, I'm going to close this up to keep the, the chicken warm. So as far as a tablescape or table setting, Swanee, how would the table have been set at this period? Well, we have a nice example in one of our dining rooms that shows an early 19th century table set for dinner. Let's go take a look at All it. All right. Ladies, keep up the great work. It smells divine. Okay, now, Swanee, what does this uh, table setting represent? Well, what we think it represents, Alan, is sort of a composite view of a uh, dining room set up, uh, a dining table set up in a period about 1825 to 1830. Really? So, I mean, this, this far out in the, <laughs> in the frontier to have this level of sophistication, I mean, that's pretty surprising. And it's really a common misconception, and I, and I can understand why people might have that perception. But our research tells us that anything you could get in Boston or New York, you could get in Little Rock. The key was the water had to be up and those steamboats had to be able to come up the river. Ah, I see. So you see this feather edge, you see the coin silver, yeah. uh, you see the wines and the different uh, beverages they would drink. Well, I love the featherware plates and the, and the platter. I have some of that. And, and of course, this coin silver, I've, I've always been attracted to it. It's very handsome. 
And often coins were melted down to create these pieces of tableware. To the chagrin of the government, and I'm in no way promoting the melting down of American silver coinage, but, <laughs> but they did it, they did it, but wholesale. Yes. Yeah. It was yeah. hard to get silver bar. Yeah. Oh, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much, Swanee. You're welcome. Great to see you again. Good to see you too. Why don't we go see if we can have some of that chicken? Let's go. <laughs>